So the reading is taken from Matthew 6, verse 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we, forgive, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us now. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word and pray that you would speak to us and encourage us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So when we have an event like the event we had yesterday, what's really fascinating to me is the wide variety of opinions that you see uh, across the news, on the day itself, Uh, People who are very celebratory and for what's going on. Uh, The mall absolutely full of thousands and thousands of people. Some who'd camped over for two days just in the hope to get a glimpse uh, of something that was going on. And people who are really excited for the opportunity to be together as a nation to celebrate uh, something that is part of our rich history as a nation. You have uh, people, as we know, on the opposite end of that spectrum who were also in London for very different reasons to protest against the monarchy. All kinds of different things and everything in between. There'll be different kinds of expectations as to what Charles is going to be like as a king. Different desires that people will have of things that he may or may not do or may or may not prioritise. Different opinions of his beliefs and what should matter to him and what he should uh, see as being important. There'll be loads of comparisons. How does he compare to his mother? How does he compare to previous kings and queens that we've had both here and in other places around the world? And within the church, lots of people will be asking, well, what about his views? What about his theology? What about his faith? What about his personal convictions of Christianity? How will he be as the head of the Church of England? Uh, Does he have faith at all? All the questions that people ask. Uh, One thing I saw yesterday that was beautiful is I cannot think of any other leader around the world who would be brought into their leadership with so much scripture as was included yesterday. It was a amazing, wasn't it? Almost every other word was a verse of scripture. Absolutely incredible. But people will be asking, well, what does that mean to him though? Is it, is it, does it mean anything to him? People, myself included, will pay close attention to the things that he says and the things that he doesn't say, particularly at his speech every year at Christmas. And there will be lots of different opinions about that. But what matters more than any of those things. What matters more than what he says and what he does and what he doesn't say and what he doesn't do, what he stands for, what he doesn't stand for, what matters more than any of those things is what he does in the secret place. What he does in the moments that are between him and God alone. The moments we can't judge. The moments we can't see. The moments we can't have an opinion about because they are between him and God. They are the moments that will matter most because they are the moments that will form him 
as a person and as a king. And the same is true for each and every single one of us. Any single one of us could profess to have faith in Jesus. Any single one of us can do or say the right things. But what matters most is what happens in the secret place between you and God. You see, Jesus is struggling or battling with this very thing as he's introducing the Lord's Prayer. The disciples have come up to him and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Now, the disciples knew very well how to pray. They were Jewish lads who had been brought up in the Jewish faith. They knew what prayer was. They knew what prayer looked like. They knew what it meant to pray. Prayer was a part of their daily lives. But there was clearly something about the way that Jesus prayed that was utterly unique. Something about the way that Jesus would withdraw himself to the secret place. Because the way they knew to pray was to be in the temple together, praying and praising together, talking to God together, praying in community. But Jesus was doing something absolutely separate, from, absolutely different to that. He was taking himself to the secret place and he was praying to God. And then when he came back, something about him was different. Something about him was doing something different or moving in a different direction. So maybe they recognize not only is he talking to God, maybe he's hearing from God as well. Maybe something's going on with Jesus. And Jesus, we want to learn how to pray like you pray. There may have been times they overheard Jesus praying. We know that happens uh, later in the Gospels. There may have been times before when they would have overheard Jesus praying and seen again that there was something unique about that relationship. And again, they're saying, Jesus, teach Teach us how to pray. They're not saying Jesus teaches how to pray because we don't know how to do it. What they're saying is Jesus teaches how to pray like you do. The way that you do. And what Jesus recognizes is that around them, people have modeled prayer, have shown prayer a lot. But not necessarily the kind of prayer that Jesus is modeling himself. Because he describes the hypocrites who pray in public and pray all these wonderful, brilliant prayers and make it seem like they're saying and doing all the right things. But something about it isn't quite right. Because the kind of prayer that Jesus is doing and the kind of prayer that Jesus is entering into is a very intimate prayer between him and God that leads to markable change in his life. It doesn't just pay lip service to God. When Jesus prays, it changes him. As he says, he hears the will of the Father and then goes on to do that will. I love the number of times you see Jesus withdraw to a quiet place to pray and then the next thing they'll go on and do something else that maybe they hadn't originally planned to do. But Jesus hears it from his Father. There's an intimacy between him and God that the disciples desire, that the Pharisees don't have, that the hypocrites don't have. And even though it sounds like they're doing everything right, what Jesus is looking at here is the heart of the one who prays, who prays willing, with willingness to be changed by that connection, by being perhaps the answer to those prayers that he prays himself. And so there's an invitation for each of us of Jesus. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Now, as a, as a teenager growing up, when I first heard this, I thought, well, that's a very strange thing. And I, I've always been sort of against the idea of being told exactly how to pray. Like this, this whole kind of thing of like you have to kneel beside your bed, close your eyes, hands together, and that's prayer. Uh, and often in our schools, when I say, let's pray, that's the default position. It's straight to it. And I've always had a bit of a, oh, I'm not sure if that's right. Surely we should pray as freely as we like and however comfortable. And and that kind of is true. But the reason Jesus is saying is go to your room and shut the door is because he's talking about this secret place. That intimacy that's just between you and God, where you are truly you. Where there's no eyes on you where there's no need to perform, where there's no need to pretend to be something you're not, where there's no need to put a mask on and pretend everything is okay when it's not, but where you can vulnerably come before God in the secret place. 
and bring your life to him in prayer. And it's a powerful thing. What Jesus is giving here is not an instruction. It's an invitation. An invitation to the secret place. An invitation to that level of intimacy that he himself shared. A few months ago when we were talking about vulnerability and the importance of of vulnerability within church and last week when we talked about it briefly as well, you may remember a few weeks ago, a few months ago, Rick said something really life-changing and challenging that was we need to be the same people in public as we are in private. Uh, And that's a real challenge uh, to each of us and every one of us, that there's this sense of being our true selves and our real selves. And that's a a two-way dynamic, being honest before God and honest before one another. Uh, And that's a really good thing. But the invitation that Jesus offers is to that place where it's us and God alone. And in that place we find his pursuing of us as well, his love of us. As we said, that place of confession as well, where we show him our true selves and see that he loves us all the same. It's a powerful thing. And it changes us. Changes us. As Lynn said a few weeks ago, you can't have a genuine encounter with Jesus and not be changed from it. It's impossible. He changes us. In Psalm 91, the psalmist puts it like this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's the words of someone in the secret place. If you want to know why David was seen as a man after God's own heart... It wasn't because he was the best king of all time. He was, for the Jews, the greatest king and held up on high esteem. But we also know he was fallen and broken. The reason, is because, the reason he was a man after God's own heart is because when he had those moments of brokenness, he found the secret place. He confessed before his God and found his love to be the same. And it changed him. You see these beautiful psalms of repentance and forgiveness and surrender uh, all through the book of Psalms. And here the psalmist is saying, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. This is what Jesus later goes on to describe as abiding in him and remaining in him. And here's the most important thing about that very well-known passage. Does anyone know where that passage comes from? Abide in me, remain in me. John 14, 15, 16, all that kind of section, Jesus saying John 15. But the whole concept of abiding in Christ is not a verse to be memorized. It's a lifestyle to be lived The invitation is to a lifestyle of abiding and remaining in that secret place all the time. Even when we're with other people, we can still be in that secret place. That invitation to relationship. And we have this wonderful gift of the word of God where we read and hear about Jesus. But even that itself is an invitation to meet the person behind it. The true word of God that is Jesus. And he invites us through his word. He invites us through prayer. He invites us through worship. He invites us through community. He invites us through our personal time with him, through the beauty of his creation, through anything that he chooses to use. He invites us to that secret place. And the trouble with the secret place is in order to really embrace it, we need to leave our religion at the door. And say, Jesus, I just come as I am. And I'm here for you, knowing that you're here for me. It's not about what it looks like. It's not about what I gain from it. It's not about what I bring to you. It's not about how I pray. It's not about where I pray or when I pray. It's about connection. The instruction, uh, what seems like an instruction to go into your room and shut the door, is an invitation that Jesus offers each and every one of us to the secret place. That's 
the place that matters. I don't know, you don't know, and we will never know what King Charles's secret place looks like. There's a sense in which you can say, by their fruit we will know. And there is truth in that as well, for sure. But actually the secret place is the thing that matters most in his reign. Regardless of what he says or doesn't say, my prayer for him as a king is that he will find Jesus in the secret place. That he will know Jesus in the secret place. That Jesus will encounter him in the secret place. And that everything else he does flows from that place. But that's my prayer for me as well. And my prayer for you. That each and every one of us will know God in the secret place. As I said, that moment of the secret place in the service was the anointing of oil. Where the screens came up. And the thing that struck me actually was was not even the screens. But for me it was the fact that there were a couple of gaps in the corners. I don't know if you could see that. Where it didn't quite join together. And the soldiers who were holding those corners were eyes down to the floor. They could have seen, but they chose not to. Because they knew how significant that moment being a private moment was. As he was anointed with the oil uh, to show God's anointing on him. A tradition that's passed through from generations through scripture. A wonderful symbol and sign of the secret place we want to invite you this morning uh, to know that secret place Uh, and so after the service if you want to pray um, in the corner with Sarah and who else is with you Uh, Mary, uh, we have some oil we'd love to anoint you if that's something you'd like them to do uh, just to help you to say today I want to know Jesus in the secret place, just as a commitment that you want to know him the anointing of oil uh, thankfully because of the New Testament and what's given to the instructions of Timothy and James and others is not just for kings and priests anymore Jesus has done something new and fresh with it so we can all receive that anointing to know him in the secret place if it's something you want for your life then we'd love to pray for you to know that this morning And it is a journey, it's a discipline, it's a practice, it's an art, it's all those things which we'll continue to reflect on through the year as we continue through our statement of becoming. But here's the truth. Every single one of you here today has an invitation to the secret place. And the only requirement is to want to be there. That's enough. Allow him to do the rest.